and its impact on Indus people while celebrating art, culture, and music of British Columbia and Hokkaido as we renew our commitment to international cooperation and truth and reconciliation. The event was co-hosted by the Center for Japanese Research and Museum Anthropology, and the Center for Japanese Research Director is Kiva Green. There's different ways to pronounce his name. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And we also, and that event was main sponsor for the Hokkaido 150, was the Consulate General of Japan in Vancouver. And we have pleasure of having Ms. Kayo Imamura and Mr. Ryosuke Nakazawa from Consulate Research Festival. Thank you for joining us. And one of the sponsors for the event was the SAQ Zebu Lab Center and uh, co host of tonight's events. And director Dr. Mike Hasselet is also with us. Thank you. Uh, in the follow-up event, I co-organized with Dr. Ayaka Yoshimizu from Asian Studies here at UBC, the Ainu, Okinawa, and Indigenity series hosted by the Center for Japanese Research last March. And Dr. Uzawa was one of the speaker for this online lecture series, as Sue just mentioned. And then SFU's Daily Lab Center also invited to Ainu scholars we have invited for their online lecture series later last year, Dr. Ishihara and Dr. Uzawa. So we have been communicating about mutual interest in this culture from Japan. So it's so great we are co-hosting this event today. And this time, we are so excited to have Dr. Uzawa with us in person. Thank you for coming all the way from Norway. <laughs> She's an Irish scholar, advocate, and artist and performer. She just participated in the Intercultural Indigenous Choreographer Creation Lab at Bank Center, where she actually did a fantastic dance performance. And she also gave a talk at UBC Okanagan before arriving here on Monday. So she's been very busy for the past <laughs> two or four weeks. And uh, she's a multilingual culture speaker, uh, scholar who speaks Japanese, English, Norwegian, and then the Thailand. She obtained her doctorate from Arctic University of Norway in 2020 and lives still in Norway. She is a founder of Ayun today. It's currently involved with planning upcoming Ayun exhibition at the University of Michigan, Museum of Art, as later. Her presentation this evening is entitled, as you see there, Recasting Eye Indigeneity in New Century Performing Arts. She will explore eye and performing arts <coughs> through discussion and performance as an important element of indigenous knowledge. Please join me in welcome Dr. Zha. This is the Aina greeting. Iran Karate. Iran Karate. According to uh, Dr. Kaino Shigeru, who was uh, one of the last Aina uh, speaker, he, he, um, he translated as, Let me touch your heart. So this is a little bit more than hello. <laughs> and, uh, thank you so much for uh, welcoming me and the co host organizer. This is it's a really uh, great honor to be here today and to meet all of you. And uh, it's very important for me to uh, connect myself and to my consciousness and your consciousness and then, then the land and nature around us. And uh, I can sing a song. And in this way, actually, I will relax more. <laughs> <laughs> so this um, I'm a song, it's a called Pirika. And it's a lullaby. I, I sing a song for my children every night. I have two girls at, the, at home. And this is uh, about today is a beautiful day. Today is a beautiful day. There is a good girl. There is a good girl. Where is she? It's a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
tells uh, my personal story to my museum work. Um, I'm uh, currently involving as a guest creator for the Iron Art Exhibition uh, in collaboration with the uh, University of um, University of Michigan Museum of Art in the United States, and uh, I have worked um, in um, Cologne in Germany for another exhibition last year, up to uh, February this year. Um, so start with. Uh, Introduction. Uh, then, then, sorry, and then I would um, play mouse harp, and then I would weave into some of my performances, including dance with new music. But uh, I am uh, uh, one of my friends in the US, musician Michael, um, the actually student of Annalise, graduate student. Uh, it's a contemporary music with um, pretty sound. And then dance, and then lastly, I would like to ask you all to sing together with me. So I hope you will join me. So I'm a, I'm a scholar, and it, it's a long story, but I have never thought of, um, this is a painting by my daughter, Kaisa, and I thought that was very beautiful because it's a mixed color, and um, she lives in the cultural environment, and uh, Japanese, uh, she listened to Ainu song, she listened to my mouse herb, she listened to me talking about Ainu things, but she was born in Norway, and she has a Swedish father, <laughs> and they speak Swedish, they talk to me in Japanese, and we talk English, and so it's kind of for me that representation of multiculturalism. <laughs> And uh, my name, Kanako, actually uh, in country, Kana um, means uh, uh, love, or, and Ko means a child, so I'm a child of my parents, that's how I interpret. And my grandfather was a political activist, so he named uh, me, uh, in my interpretation, he, he was hoping to, he was hoping that I would reach between North and South. Mm -hmm. That's my interpretation, and I like it. <laughs> And um, I never thought of becoming a scholar or anything. Um, I wasn't a big fan of uh, books or mm -hmm. I was more, I, I enjoy physical uh, movement. So uh, when I was younger, a university student in Tokyo, I started working at the Aino restaurant where I learned Aino um, cuisine and some plants. And, and so I became part of a community in Tokyo, actually. There is a community in Tokyo as well. And they had performance, uh, performing uh, group, performing arts group. So I became part of that. That's how I learned dance and song. Um, but later on, I realized that by participating in international conferences and talk, uh, often a story of Ainu are told by non-indigenous, non Ainu persons and scholars, often male, and I was in the audience listening, hmm, I can do better. <laughs> 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 it felt very strange that somebody else talking about my culture, mm -hmm. and it didn't signal the same message, and, and this <laughs> It felt very strange that somebody else talking about my culture, and it didn't signal the same message and, and this emotional attachments that we could have. So I said, hmm, how can I go to, you know, change the space? And how can I come and stand this space to talk about my culture? So one uh, way uh, is to, of course, to receive high education so that I get the like, opportunity like here. So I'm very grateful that uh, it was very hard as for me to um, uh, travel all the way to Norway and receive higher education all along. I was only Asian person in my department, mm -hmm. or even faculty. So Asian study was not a big part of the, the university at all. So um, I have to kind of raise the voice, and I want to do that Ainu studies, and nobody knew about uh, Ainu. They know, oh yeah, yeah, Japan, sushi, and onsen, <laughs> and uh, culture. So when I finished, I was so happy, and then you know started to uh, uh, receive more requests. So here I am, and I do. Uh, it's a dancer artist, um, and 
I'm a mother, and I do arts because um, I think through art we can reach out wider audience. Um, it's you know you can open up more dialogue in informal way, and I, I like to talk to children. I like to talk to elders, so it's uh, uh, used that as a tool to communicate with wider audience. So my mother, my father is actually Japanese. So this is uh, Mako Nibutani, where my mother comes from. It's a very small community, 400 um, people living in and around. And maybe some of you have even been to Nibutani, have you? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, it's a very small community, but uh, uh, culturally it's very rich. They still speak, um, they actually uh, started to have Ainu language class for um, public school. And uh, not so many hours, but nevertheless, it's very good positive. They have private Ainu language class, and a very uh, culturally rich and active community. So I was exposed, even though I was living in Tokyo, because my mother had a job. My mother is from this community. Even though my mother had a job, I was uh, Spending time with my grandparents and cousin here in Nibutani, so I was exposed to Ainu culture, language, dance, and so it was just part of me. But I never thought I was so important to learn um, when I grew up because nobody told me, "Oh, this is very important." Because I think in my mother's generation, grandparents' generation, uh, they received lots of uh, discrimination. It's the same story here, I'm sure, and uh, it was not so encouraged. Um, but um, I would come back to that. But this is a picture of my mother's family from the taking the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the mom uh, in the front, for you, is right. It's Uesana. She, he, he was a sculptor, and he was, I heard he was pretty good at it. So um, uh, I will show you some of his work in the next slide. And uh, Monum Fanon, so he's my, uh, the great, Great grandfather, and uh, he uh, Monopano has a tattoo. Maybe you have seen it in the, some of the pictures of Ainu in the past. So this is um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we say uh, matur maturity of women uh, when you become uh, when you are um, about to marry, but you're gonna you start actually tattooing early age, teenage, around fifty, around that slowly. Do that. But it was also prohibited um, by the government in the late 20th century. So this is a uh, work by Uesanashi. Mm -hmm. It's uh, over 100 years old. And we still use them um, at home. It's not, I don't hold this, possess this, but uh, my uncle, aunt, they have it. And they took a picture and sent them to me. You know, you can see how old it is. It's just, it's very emotional for me to see. And when I, when I um, uh, see the art, artifacts or object, and I just learned from Phoebe, Phoebe some today that actually at the more you see belongings, and that's one wonderful way of mm -hmm. describing it. And I, I feel very uh, sad when I, whenever I see the uh, belongings and showcase in the museum. But this is still in your hand. So everybody has uh, somebody who inspires us, right? So that was my grandfather, Tadashi Kaizawa. He was a political activist. And uh, he, was, uh, he devoted him his life for uh, political movement, environment. So he, started to, he was a farmer, but he was also a political uh, activist. And, um, a uh, member of an association, Hokkaido, in Sapporo. And uh, he wrote uh, some of the, he did some writing, even though he didn't receive education. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, one of the reasons um, I could receive education, because he was always encouraging me to get higher education, to, you know, to be able to stand uh, equal platform as Japanese. You must receive higher education, especially when you're a woman. So he saved the money for me, and um, after he unfortunately passed away, when I was uh, around 12 or 20, uh, I received the 
uh, saving and, and I use it as a part of my education. I did a, a BA in the United States, so I use that for my education and I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity. And uh, um, he also taught me how to be proud of who we are and never give up. So, so this always like, keeps coming back when I have uh, challenges in, in my life. And he was also one of, uh, um, uh, he wasn't a plaintiff, but he was uh, uh, one of the activists who was against dam construction. Who, um, that dam is now built and completed in 1997 and became a, a big court case because uh, uh, Dr. Shigeru Kayano and actually my uncle sued the government and we won the case and that was the very first court case. And um, then after that, uh, the court recognized I'm as a minor ethnic minority groups and indigenous uh, indigenous to the language. So this became a, a big case and, and drew international attention and people started, oh what, what does that indigene, indigeneity or indigenous actually mean? So that was a very important case. So who are Ainu? Maybe many of you already know, but means uh, I know means human beings. Uh, we traditionally lived in Hokkaido, uh, Kulin Island, Sah uh, Southern Sahalin, and some of the uh, Northern Honshu. And traditionally, we practiced hunting. We hunted deer and bear sometimes. We used the bear for ritual. And uh, fishing, salmon is our main, uh, staple food. And uh, now uh, we have limited uh, fishing rights, so there are fishing rights uh, for the case going on at the moment. But um, we use uh, salmon, for example. You, you, the philosophy is that we have to use all parts to show the respect to the growth of salmon. We believe in aminism, so that means that we use the head and bones to make a, a bouillon in the soup. So you boil it at a low temperature for a couple of days and to make a soup, a little salt, and lots of vegetables. It's called kohau. And we used to take the skin and make the shoes out of that. And so for and foraging wild plants is still practiced in the community. So in spring comes, this is like a very popular activity for a, a female or woman in the community and we go to the mountain and this is also a wonderful opportunity for intergenerational uh, learning space. And then we have medicinal plants still um, and we have the plant, wild plants called shitopino, which is like a, a sound, uh, it tastes like a garlic. So, Locals say, don't go, don't eat the uh, kitopiro before the date. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, but this kitopiro also has other, other side because because it smells, the next day everybody can smell, oh, you have eaten kitopiro because kitopiro was considered as an plant. Mm -hmm. So this kind of triggered discrimination. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lots to say about this plant, kitopiro. And the end of the uh, um, 20th century to the 21st century, you know, the idol uh, also uh, became a big thing of, uh, or became fascinating research object. Some of the scholars uh, believe that we have, we are related to application because of the physical difference to the Japanese, and they became very fascinated. After Edo era, when the um, Sakoku uh, uh, period, isolation of foreign policy open. There are many foreigners came, missionaries, uh, and you know, it was possible to go in and out of the, of the country. So uh, that ended, um, resulted in uh, unethical digging and stealing of Ainu human remains. Uh, which was over, this is the information from 2019, but that time was uh, 1,574 and human remains are stored in 12 universities throughout the country. And, and now we have Upopoe, which is the uh, new National Museum of Ayn, a built memorial facility 
they have this human over 1,323. And some of them are not possible to be identified. So therefore, we cannot reproduce. So I just want to um, mention that uh, because I knew or became a very fascinating object in a museum setting, I knew participated in those uh, events. Human Pavilion in Osaka, 1903, 1904, Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, 1910, Japan British Exhibition in London. So um, this was, as you all know, uh, was a part of, uh, it was used as a justification of colonialism and known as human zoo. So when I was trying to study about this, I crossed this article written by uh, uh, Dr. Zilme, a student of actually Annalise. <laughs> um, and and uh, this is a state, my statement by the Fushine Koso Ekashi. Ekashi means the uh, all the uh, respected elderly man. So he was very fluent in both languages, which was rare at that time. And he went to Osaka, um, but he couldn't, he couldn't, he was teaching Ainu language culture to his, to the children in the community, but he couldn't read. Mm. So that meant that when he went to Osaka, he, he uh, mistakenly taken uh, police office for udon shop or something like that. <laughs> so that was like, uh, he was pointing out in this article that, you know, how difficult it is for the Aino. You know, if you can't read, it's very difficult to even navigate yourself in the Japanese society. So I just gonna read this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Aino called Fushine Yastaro. Uh, he changed the name. The reason why I'm here in Osaka this time is to appeal to you for a helping hand in fulfilling my hopes. I can say that being Ainu, we feel that we're Japanese. At this very moment, we Ainu can now appear for cons conscription examination and loyalty serve His Majesty Emperor. It's sad, however, that we cannot become decent soldiers because we Ainu do not have education. It has been my goal for many years to strive, however, I can to enhance Ainu education. So he, it's interesting, he identified himself both Japanese and Ainu. And this is and emphasizing the importance of education. That leads to my connection to my grandfather. So this is kind of, for me, it's very, I get emotional when I read this because this is a continuation of um, activism from the past to the present. And this is, by the way, the Ainu house system. This is how it looks like inside. So exhibition in Cologne um, at uh, Lautensch, uh, it's, very, it's a long and difficult name to pronounce, but uh, I try my best. Lautensch, Lauten, do you have a German person? <laughs> <laughs> Lautenstrauch Jost Museum, Culture of the World. So I was um, contacted by, uh, by uh, creators, uh, Walter and Abel, uh, last year. Um, and they were working on an exhibition in collaboration with Hukukoi Museum. Um, but they wanted, really wanted to, because they had so many artifacts. Mm. 280, and that's a lot. So, but they quickly realized that, you know, instead of just displaying those objects, they should include an artist. So, but how can they do that? And they should, uh, you know, if possible, they wanted to work with an artist, so they were trying to, uh, they did the research to try to reach out to the old an contemporary artist, and I was one of them. I was a very honor to be invited to open the exhibition. And these are uh, main collection uh, collected by uh, a Polish photographer, Peter Stuski. He had 80 historical photographs. And he went to, uh, I think, Sahanin, and then 
he actually married an Ainu uh, lady and who was a daughter of the chief in that village because she was teaching him Ainu language. So he, it wasn't only that he was a um, photographer and ethnologist, but he, he became very involved in the community. And other objects were collected by this German um, ethnographer and world traveler, Joost and Uma, Uma. So those are, oh, it's not here. But for example, those are, for example, those uh, youth, uh, these, they live in Yudani, and one of them actually, uh, Mancha has, um, she took uh, the YouTube channel called Shito Channel, which is a three minutes short uh, YouTube channel that introduces how to learn other language. It has been very popular. Um, and I have, by the way, my own website which lists all the island related contemporary literature, not like old one, but contemporary, both English and Japanese. It's called Ainu Today, and uh, I'm using her channel as well. Okikano is a very famous Ainu musician, um, play Tonkori, and I, I don't know if he has been to Baku, but maybe not yet. And myself, yes. So I uh, I made this dance video, and they ask um, if they can uh, commission the work. So it was displayed at the uh, part of the um, exhibition. And going back to uh, human remains, in 2016 there was a um, an event in Japan that some of 12 12. Uh, I mean, in Marume, I think, and now even more, but returned to the local community, and it was very emotional for the Ainu community because that was the second time that we received um, Ainu human remains. So that kind of triggered the discussion of human remains overseas as well. So they, they, they did some research, and they found actually that there are 17 Ainu bodies held in Germany. So I knew about this case, so I, uh, I uh, brought this discussion to the museum and asked, can we uh, talk about this in the exhibition as a part of our... Uh, yes, yes, that's a good idea. So I made a short film uh, talking about, about this um, the event. So 2017, one of the uh, body uh, was returned to the representative of the Ainu Association of Hokkaido and Japanese government from German academic society. And it was, it was um, found out that it was stolen by German tourists in Sapporo in 1879. So this exhibition was very unique in the European context. Maybe in Canada, I know that more is very progressive in this way, but um, it was very unique because they actively uh, involved uh, Ainu inviting me and uh, allowed me to open the exhibition. So I made a point that in the ex op uh, opening of the exhibition, I said this is very emotional for me because over 100 years ago, Ainu was exhibited, exhibited as a living object. But now here I'm standing and I have a voice and education. So this was very, uh, uh, important moment for me. Uh, this is a website that uh, if any of you are interested in Ainu, contemporary Ainu, I must say. Thank you, Yerakere, and now I will move on to uh, performing art. Uh, so I play this. 
So it used to be used for expressing ourselves, feelings, right, to, uh, for loved one or family members. It's kind of a old letter or <laughs> communication tool. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, for an example, I close my throat, open, close, so it's kind of throat singing in a way. And you can, uh, I make, I will also make a sound of air.
Yeah. Sure. Maybe frog that they do on. Oh, yes, something small, yes. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs>
So this is a, actually I forgot to mention before, but it is about um, how human comes into the forest. As we are coming into the forest, we always pray, uh, let the nature, mountain, and uh, all animal let them know that, okay, I'm here, I'm coming in, please protect us. So what I did now is a narrative of human me coming into the forest, and then they see the beautiful butterflies, and then I wanted to catch, and I catch it. But he wanted to fly away, so I let him do that. And then I transform into grasshopper. And then on the way, I did the laundry. <laughs> so I have to dry, so I did the birds. And then birds, and then in the end, feeling of the wind. So that's the last movement, as you know, the leaf of the trees. So this is a dance, thank you very much. And I have a, a gift for all of you today, which is an I'm song that you will, you will remember and, and sing together. So this is a Asashika Rock Upopo. This is a call and response Upopo from the Asashika region, northwest central Okajo. And uh, Upopo is usually very long, but to be just kind to you all, I made it short. <laughs> and I don't know, have you ever done Upopo? Maybe. Analyse. So she can lead you all. <laughs> so it goes like this, I just sing a couple of times. Start house up, 
then you go hausa. And you go hausa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we try? Yes. Maybe we, we sing one more time all together. And then you go one step. So again, five, six, seven, eight. Hausa, hau, hoya, hau. together with, with Kanako-san, um, my dear friend, whom I uh, I just have to say very briefly that um, I am able to um, have learned uh, the very important lessons of how to be respectful and to be a guest in Ainu Moshiri, uh, some people call it Yaun Moshiri, because of Kanako. She's really been my guide and my dear friend, <laughs> sorry, uh, for more than 20 years since I was a little grasshopper myself. So, <laughs> so um, and, and as you can see, she's now a teacher to my own students, so I'm hugely grateful to her. Um, it's a great honor, but this is really about you and a chance for you to ask questions that you might have for her. Um, she's lived quite an incredible multicultural life, as you can see, but the thing that's incredible is that she's grounded um, in the teachings and in the, um, the knowledge and the relationship with the land of her grandparents and her parents and her aunts and uncles and she has she has really this sort of uh, incredible uh, Ainu family and uh, we can learn so much from all of them so this is an opportunity for each of you uh, to ask questions if you may so we'll open up the floor now. Good afternoon and Arigato for sharing um, some of your culture. I, I am not a Japanese speaker I try to learn but I am curious because you said um, you know with uh, your forebears that education is very important. And I was wondering, um, does Ainu have written language? And has that been a challenge if it isn't, if it's more just an oral tradition? So how, how do you um, do it justice in terms of trying to capture the cadence or the sounds if you have to adapt Japanese as I saw the lyrics? Thank you for a uh, very important question. So we, uh, we traditionally uh, our language, we, uh, we don't have written language, so it's oral. Mm -hmm. So that meant that we have fantastic memory capacity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my aunt, aunt used to say, you know, they used to remember the name of our relatives, name of the people that goes back to 120 years or 100 years. And, and ironically, 
those written documents and reports uh, by missionary and researcher that has been done over 100 years ago have been, uh, become very important resource to revitalize the language. So it's a, it's a bit uh, ironical situation, but um, that's the, it has been very helpful to revitalize. And now it's even more. Uh, a younger generation are aware of Ayan culture and migration identity. So more news are coming up. And uh, what I'm doing now is, uh, is um, because when I finished the PhD, I felt like, OK, now I can make my own path as an independent, independent person, as a woman, and uh, raise awareness. Not to be afraid of being attacked. Um, you know, if you don't have PhD, maybe people may criticize you for your knowledge. So, so I, we hope that more uh, youth will come out and feel more comfortable uh, with who they are uh, and their own expression. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what was the biggest obstacle to the repatriation of Ainu bodies? Because it, because in your slides you mentioned that there was only uh, there were seven I knew I knew bodies within Germany and only one was repatriated. So what is the biggest obstacle to getting the rest returned back to the uh, their own people? So obstacle was was. Uh, it has to be um, uh, proven that it was stolen. So, so some of them don't have a record on it, or name, so which community they come from. So it was that was the reason why only one of them was returned. And it's the same with the human remains that have been held at the Ukupoi Museum. Some of them can't find out where they come from, which family they belong to. Yeah, and just uh, related to that, I actually am curious uh, how you think about to repatriate actual artifacts, not human remains, uh, because you saw lots of well, things actually in uh, Germany too. And do you think that uh, they should, those artifacts should be also returned to China or Hokkaido? Yes, they, they, definitely. But uh, and especially like this museum, Nautilus Just Museum, had very uh, rare findings that we don't see anymore in Japan, and but they're just lying there in the storage room. And um, I'm trying to work with those. So my next project is to to look into those artifacts, trying to find a narrative backstory and why it was collected, and, but uh, make it more like artistic. So next project with the Italian photographer is to make a video art. So I put some narratives, do some research on certain object, and uh, use it for the educational purposes or uh, exhibition display and as an installation. And, uh, but also I saw that it is also important to have the object to tell the story that what had happened. So that's my stance. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, so thank you so much for being here and also for sharing with us your experience today. I'm curious about the discourse on Ainu people in current Japan. So you also mentioned like how the elderly um, Ainu um, talks about his own experience at the turn of the century. So I am really interested to know more about like the shift and what compelled the shift and what yeah. what. Like, um, is there any like paradigm shift in the discourse on Ainu people in Japan over the years, and what compels the changes? Um, it's a long story, but uh, it's uh, because you know Ainu are first time recognized as an indigenous 2008 by the government, and after that, it's it's uh, increasingly you know now we have national museum, and before. Uh, when I grew up, it was, not, or even my mother, like, why do you want to do this? Uh, and uh, my grandparents also, uh, except my grandfather or uncle who are engaged in the political movement, they questioned, why are you doing this? 
what's the point, right? And, and I'm sure it's very common here too in the generation. And, but now it's very changing because uh, find it uh, more use of finding it, it's actually learning a new language and finding their own way of expressing is very joyful and a very powerful tool. So they're engaging in the cultural, uh, culture and the language revitalization movement, learning the dance and songs. So I have great hope. And, uh, and media, has, and media, social media, uh, newspaper, radio, all of that have been taking up lots of uh, I know, cultural uh, subjects. So it has been a lot discussed. So, but the point is that you know, who is, has the power to control that all of that? You know, are we participating as a, a, a main player in that representation of the of the discourse or not? Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kanako-san. That was amazing, and uh, you transport all of us into uh, into the culture of the Ainu. So thank you. Um, I had two questions, um, very different. Uh, do you know anything about what's happening on the Russia side mm -hmm. uh, with the Kurils and Sahalin? And uh, I, I had a student last year from Russia, and, and he said he was involved in engagement with the indigenous people in, in the Kuril Islands. So there seemed to be something. But and is there any connection? at all that are being remade between the Ainus in Hokkaido and the Ainus in Kuril to Sakhalin. Uh, and my second question, maybe simpler, is given that the Ainus were fishing a lot and, and they were all over the archipelago, where all the island, Kuril Islands, etc., there must be a deep connection to the ocean. And so we, how is the ocean and, and the big animals like the whales, orcas, etc., represented in Ainu culture? Uh, was there canoe building as well, etc., in the culture? Yes, uh, but, uh, first question is uh, it's actually uh, uh, when I was a uh, university student, there was culture exchange between Ainu, Hokkaido Ainu, and I think it was Sahalin, not a clip. I, I'm not, I don't remember, but I think Sahalin, there was an organization, so there was a, some exchange. I couldn't, I couldn't go for some reason that time. And there were some, one or two who identified themselves as still I know, in Sahalin, and I saw the newspaper article about that as well. Um, but other than that, I don't really know. It's, it's very rare, and yeah very limited information about them, unfortunately. The second question, yes, there are, I don't know about the, those are big whales and, and seals. I know that was used as a trading with the Japanese, but also uh, uh, canoe was very important um, tool to, of course, to go uh, for the transportation. Uh, when they didn't have, well, we didn't have a, a, a road and the canoe um, making is still in practice for more like a ritual, like to remember our culture. So August 20, in this Nintani community, we have um, had a festival, what was the name? Chibisanke. Ah, Chibisanke. So this is uh, revitalized by uh, Dr. Shigeru Kayano, and uh, to remember the kind of making and the connection to the river, uh, that southern river that we had. And, and by the way, I came to uh, um, British Columbia Arab Bay uh, when I was a uh, child together with uh, Dr. Uh, Shigeru Kayano. I was part of Ayurveda language class, even though I was not actually, yeah, because he, he and uh, my grandparents are friends, so they asked if I could join. And then I met uh, Gloria Webster, and she welcomed us in um, the Bay Koko Kawak. And then I saw how proud the youth were. They spoke their language, their dance, and it was very uh, strong memory for me. So I have the connection, the emotional connection to Colombia. So for that reason, I'm also grateful that I could reach out. Um, the, someone had already asked my question, but then it made me think of you personally. And I think I just, I want to raise my hands to you 
and for all you carry, and for what you hold in your heart. I have, um, my husband is from Hokkaido. Um, we go to Japan and we go to his home. And for the, over the last 18 years, we've seen quite a difference in the respect and honor of the people. And um, it, it makes me feel I'm Kosevish. My people are from Stanevach. And I, I grew up not knowing where I was from, but what I hear in your voice is what I hear in my heart. And uh, so I, I know uh, is that you, you feel called. Or I hear, I feel called, and I'm curious <laughs> about your, um, your resilience and your, how you are here on this, this, how you were able to look at the people and say, I could do that better. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> what, what, um, perhaps you can just speak a little bit about that. But before, I just also, um, yeah, I just want to raise my hands to you. And I feel a lot of similarities between Coast Salish culture and your culture. Uh, so it's, it's so beautiful to hear you and, and be here with you today. You said that I feel something. I didn't. I didn't hear what you said. You feel something came. Home? A call. 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 Like like oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Holy. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh. Oh, how nice. Thank you for beautiful words. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, like I wouldn't have been here if I didn't meet all these people, including you all and the people who brought me here today. Michael, Phil, Sam, you and everybody. And also all this um, support that I got from elders. And now when I came to Banff, there are elders, um, uh, indigenous elders from uh, Calgary or different parts. They are faculty members. And they say, you know, listening is as important as uh, talking. So we all learn how to listen. And that's that has been always my uh, motto: to listen carefully, uh, be patient, and it takes long time. In which it took long time for me to feel confident and be proud. And I see um, some of my friends are very uh, bullied at school or in the marriage, um, was rejected by um, the partner's parents, or you know all these things, very negative thing, alcoholism. Not so much drug though. So, but then I feel like we could, you know, what can I do? You know, how can I contribute to this process of cultural revitalization, but mostly you know, how we can be proudly of who, who we are. So one of the ways is to bring in positive aspects of the culture and language, which for me is performing art, because I love dancing and singing and all that, because then I can reach out wider audience, and we can all enjoy. So, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is your website and the work you do as you talk about as contemporary? Um, I'm wondering what it is that you really hope that your own children and other Ainu youth can learn um, from seeing you dance and all this other contemporary Ainu um, representation on your website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, that uh, there is a freedom and the uh, opportunity if you want to. And uh, we are here to support them and to be afraid. And, and that's very important because they are all very unique in their own way. And they're always a way uh, to express if there is a possibility, if the opportunity is given, and we should all support that. So by uh, promoting Ainu culture through my website, like I get uh, questions, different requests all over the world. Surprisingly, there are many. And I'm very happy that I did it because otherwise I wouldn't have known. Mm. And through that, I reconnected to so many people who are interested in Ainu culture. And uh, amazing, you know, how many people are interested. You know, so a small group of people of, of Japan, indigenous people of Japan. So. Thank you. Check, check. Okay. Um, thank you for everything you 
chaired uh, my name is Michelle Flam and um, I'm an associate professor at Winter School here and I was the first person in my family to do doctoral work so I appreciate that you had your grandpa up there and that you recognize the important path that you have made um, and I just wanted to uh, share a teaching with you um, that is probably part of what is motivating you and that was shared with me and that is the idea that the decisions that we make today uh, we consider the last seven generations and the next seven coming and I think you're doing um, very very important work and always remember to honor your, your grandfather for the inspiration he gave you so thank you for starting with that and bringing that into a part of what you shared today I really appreciate that thanks want to do the same for the youth, so hopefully more youth um, will take it as inspiration or motivation so I can pass it on then. So thank you so much. What, what is the recognition of the government of Japan nowadays and what are they doing to, um, to incorporate and to, in, to be more inclusive towards So the, rec the recognition of government of Japan towards Ainu, the yeah. Ainu community, okay. <laughs> is the question. Mm. So we have a new law now, Ainu new law, um, uh, enacted in uh, 2019, and that's, but uh, those, we had a previous law which always only promoted the cultural aspect of it, that still continues, and there was a protest against it because, you know, cultural Promotion is one thing, but to give us freedom as self-determination and uh, rights to exercise the culture and also develop is also important. That part is not given to us yet. That's why the fishing rights is limited. We can only get the salmon to the amount that we need for the ceremony, which is like a ten. Um, then that's, that's not enough. If it is staple food, just like a bread, for uh, some people, you know, it should be given. And so they, su they, they support uh, within their framework, but it's very far away from our need. They may support financially, and they, like uh, National um, Museum of Boy, for example, included Ainu uh, creators uh, in the process. So, but I don't know a detail about it, how much they actually involved, how much uh, power they have in the decision-making process. That's the most important part when it comes to uh, self-determination. Mm -hmm. And so this is a question, but also like the discussion of indigenous rights, self-determination, and as such are also very new, newly introduced in Japan. Um, so that is the discussion that we have to take up. My name is Hukla and I'm of the Shibakmi Nation and the Silks Nation from the interior of British Columbia. And I live on these lands of my Coast Salish cousins. I honor your bravery. Thank you so much for sharing. Because we share the same kind of things, the hatred, the horrible life conditions that uh, polite Canadians don't like to talk about. <laughs> so, um, and I'm always the one that brings up the hard stuff. You know, so I just want to say I honor you. We stand in solidarity with you. My family brings greetings to your family way over there across the world. Cooks Jan, Cooks Jan, Cooks Jan. Mm -hmm. えっと、日本語で、あの、すごく
で彼女はあのアイドルの踊りも紹介してましたそれで、えー、とそういう何て言うんですかコレオグラフとかの,あの舞台とかもいろいろ教えていて私はそのクラスを取ってたんですけども、うん、だから、えー、と須藤先生は<笑>あの国からの,あのお金が出て少しですけどもそれであのそういう、えー、と歌とかのそのなんていうんですかメロディーとかもちゃんとあの楽譜にしてあのしてらしたんですけどねそういうのをもしご,ご存知だったらもう私はあのこちらに来てから20年経ってるので須藤先生がどうしてらっしゃるのかちょっと分かんないんですけどもあのもしご存知でしたらそういうコネクションを作られたらすごくあのいやあなたのためにもなると思いますしそういう楽譜もあるしそれからあの実際にすごい簡単な踊りですけどもあの私たちも習いますのでできると思います。Um, Sudo is、um, matching、um, Ainu,、uh, Ainu melodies and Ainu dance、um, and incorporating that in her,、uh, in her teaching and her dancing. And she was very much influenced and impressed by that and would like for,、uh, to want to introduce it to Hanako san so, in case when she returns or when she has a chance to go back to Japan, she might go back to it and、uh, learn more about that. That was her comment. <laughs> So, I just wanted to, just very briefly,、um, I just wanted to say a, a huge、um, thank you to all of you. And this is a bit off script, but、um, this didn't come up in Kaneko's presentation. But I just wanted to mention that,、um, unfortunately, as in much of the world, I'll just take my mask off so you can see my face.、Um, there was a question about what the Japanese government is currently doing right now to support Ainu. And yes, there's a new law that has been passed, but unfortunately, there's also A horrific backlash right now of hate speech and right wing、um, bashing of Ainu. And so I mention this in part because I want everyone to be very respectful with any images or photos or material that you have taken from today's presentation because sadly we're in an era where、um, incredible, brave,、uh, you know, courageous individuals like Kaneko who are out here doing this incredible work of, of sharing her beloved culture with all of us. Um, stand the possibility of being attacked when they travel, when they go home. So, I want us all just be aware of that and be very respectful with this material. But、uh, by the same token, this is an opportunity for all of us to share and introduce in a positive way this incredible work, the incredible resilience, the incredible、um, the refusal to be silenced of the Ainu community.、Um, and please take that message home and share it with other indigenous folks in your neighborhood. Um, with non indigenous folks, especially. This is a message that, you know, I'm not even, I'm not a Canadian myself, but I'm learning very much about the reconciliation process, and this is something that we can all learn because it's a global struggle. So all of us have quite a responsibility, and I'm very grateful that Conoco brought us her story to, to help us think about that. So I'll close with that and just say a huge yaira kire to her. So, thank you so much for being here tonight. And it's been、um, several years since I guess we first met through、uh, email communications, and I'm so glad that everything was able to work out to have, even though. The Norwegian Airlines went on strike. <laughs> right before you're about to come, you did a heroic 12 hour drive in the suite to get here. And I'm so grateful for everything that's been involved in, in working with Fayubi san, has been amazing to provide us this incredible place. And I think it's just so suitable that you brought your diverse and creative examples of what I think of as serious joy. 
that mm -hmm. is part of um, what it is that you do, and that this has become an important place uh, for you since you were since you were young and connecting with language revitalization here, and now that uh, you know, the Ainu have played such a critical role in these kind of trans-Pacific and global connections um, themselves. So this is kind of going full circle in all these ways. I have a, um, a small gift for you, and I guess you've probably seen this, um, this book, but it is uh, first, uh, first Peoples and First Fish. And it is about the beautiful art, and it has um, some essays by uh, Kana Shigeru, who you travel with. And so it's about the, I think, the connections uh, to the, of the Pacific through the salmon, and also people of salmon, and, and the connections that you brought. It's just a, a joy to have you here to share everything with us. So, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> So now we, yeah, thank you. But thank you so much for coming. I hope